Welcome back to the channel. And uh, we're going to have part two of the Century Series program. The Century Series was uh, a family of aircraft that flew in the 1950s. It was the first family of supersonic fighters for the United States Air Force. And it was uh, six airplanes that were designed for different mission requirements and operational capabilities. We had a bit of discussion in the comments about where does the Century Series really end? We know it starts with the F-100 at upper left. Did it end with the F-106 at lower left or the F-110? Or was this airplane the end of the Century Series? Well, let's find out in Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. But first, an announcement coming soon from Hobby Rama West. We are proud to bring back our in-studio series, which features plastic model kits, original factory models, proposal models, and uh, we're looking forward to bringing these to you. Uh, these are currently in production. We'll be bringing them in the weeks ahead. Our first episodes will be dealing with gift sets, those special models you got for your birthday or Christmas. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. We hope you join us for this uh, new series. But if you're ready for some Century Series action, let's get into it. The Century Series, to, uh, specifically the designations, F-100 to, well, let's find out. By way of review, if you didn't see part one, I have a link to that video at the end of this program. But we began with the North American F-100 Super Sabre at upper left and the McDonald F-101 Voodoo, the uh, B model, the two seat interceptor version shown there at lower right. And a small correction, I mentioned that the missiles on the 101B were carried externally. That is true, but the aircraft was fitted with a rotating weapon bay uh, that you see in the forward fuselage there, and that allowed the aircraft to carry a, a variety of missiles. Uh, it would fire one set, and then the uh, bay would uh, turn over and fire the second set. So I just wanted to clarify that, and thanks to the viewers that brought that to my attention. Then we have the F-102 at lower right, the first Delta Wing fighter for the Air Force, and uh, the F-104 Starfighter from Lockheed, the world's first Mach 2 operational jet aircraft. I mentioned that the engine in the F-104, the General Electric J-79, was approximately the same thrust category as the Pratt & Whitney J-75. And again, a number of viewers with uh, expertise in power plants uh, questioned that and were commenting on the, the different thrust ratings. And they're, depending on the engine model and the type of airplane they were mounted in, uh, there was a, a range of thrust ratings. It might've been more appropriate to say the General Electric J-79 and the Pratt & Whitney J-75 were of the same generation of turbojet power plant. The J-75 powered the Republic F-105 Thunder Chief and the Convair F-106 Delta Dart, as well as the North American F-107A. The F-108 that you see there in the rendering uh, never made it past the mock-up stage, as did the Republic XF-103 and the Bell XF-109. But the F-110, designation was given to the Air Force uh, version of the F-4 Phantom. And yes, I realize that the lower photo is the F-4J, a late model Phantom, not the F-4B. But uh, as my Navy pilot friends like to say, I use this photo because, well, it just looks cool. So we're gonna go from the Mach 2 airplanes of the 1950s to the Mach 3 airplanes of the 1960s and some interesting new programs that happened in the early 1960s as well. In 1962, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara changed the designations so that there would be a standardization between all the different services. So the numbers that had advanced to B-70 for the bombers reverted back to the beginning with the B-1. The cargo airplanes went from 141 to 5 for the Air Force. Uh, the C-1 and C-2 were uh, the Grumman Trader and Greyhound uh, Cod airplanes for the Navy. And then we have the F-111. Now this designation stuck because uh, the airplane was developed right before the change. And so the F-111A for the Air Force uh, became operational in a number of different versions serving with the tactical uh, and strategic air commands. Uh, while the Navy version at top there uh, was built with the assistance of Grumman and uh, that airplane did not uh, turn out to be successful. Grumman went on of course to build the F-14. But I mention this now because uh, it's an interesting distinction that at one time, at the change of the designations in 1962, Grumman had the F-111B as well as the F-11A. 
The F-11A was the new designation for the F-11 F-1 Tiger. So now we pick up the numbers. We have the F-12, Lockheed's uh, interceptor version of the Blackbird family. And was there ever an F-13? Well, technically, yes, it's kind of a trick question. Let me show you a picture of an F-13. Yeah, it was the photo recon variant of the B-29 at the end of World War II. F at that time stood for photo. Uh, that was later changed to R for reconnaissance. So let's pick up the numbers with the Grumman F-14, the F-15, F-16, Northrop F-17 lightweight fighter prototype, which lost the competition to the F-16, but was later evolved into the F-18. And then we have the F-19 stealth fighter, the F-20, wait a minute, F-19, what is that? You know what? We'll come back to this one. Northrop's F-20 Tiger Shark, final evolution of the F-5 family, and the F-21, which was a variant of the Israeli Kafir, which itself was a variant of the Dassault Mirage, used as an aggressor airplane. We had the Lockheed Martin F-22, the Northrop F-23, which lost to the F-22 in the Advanced Tactical Fighter Competition in the early 1990s. And this brings us to the F-24 Joint Strike Fighter. This was a fly-off competition in the year 2000 uh, between the Boeing X-32 and the Lockheed Martin X-35. The idea here is that there would be three variations of these designs to be used by the Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps, all centered around one principal aircraft. Winner of that fly-off competition was the X-35. And it would stand to reason that uh, this would become the F-24, next number up in the series. But for standardization, it was decided that the X-35 would become the F-35 Lightning II. So what about that F-19 stealth fighter? Well, here's a model. And uh, gee, could the year possibly be uh, 1979 that this was all happening? Yeah, this, uh, there was a buzz in the industry that the stealth fighter was uh, under development. It was highly classified at the time, brand new technology, revolutionary airplane. And this model and this rendering by uh, uh, artist Attila Hedja uh, was in all the trades, all the magazines, Popular Mechanics, Aviation Week, you name it. Uh, and these things were splashed all over the place to show the world what the coming stealth fighter would be uh, looking like. Well, when the real airplane took to the air, it was revealed to the public in 1983, it looked like this. I took these photos from a KC-10 on the uh, first ever showing of the airplane uh, to the Air Force Art Program. And uh, there's a shot from the Boomer Station, but it's all straight lines and flat facets. I think the only uh, curved surface in the airplane is probably the pilot seat cushion. So this airplane was designated the Lockheed F-117 Nighthawk. Okay, so it's three digits. Technically, it could be a member of the Century Series, although it came quite a, a few years later. But wait a minute. If this is the F-117, what happened to 112 through 116? Some of the viewers of this channel may already know. Those were Soviet fighters that were captured and used by the United States Air Force in Operation Constant Peg, referred to, the squadron rather, was referred to as the Red Eagles. Uh, the Air Force used the MiG-17, the MiG-21 that you see here, the MiG-23, uh, for adversary training, where Air Force pilots could fly against actual enemy aircraft uh, to learn the tactics. And uh, it was an interesting program, but those numbers were assigned to the various models of those three Soviet airplanes. So here's a little fun. This is the uh, Century Circle uh, silhouette adaptation uh, derived from an iconic photograph taken uh, looking straight down from a helicopter, these airplanes parked on the ramp at Edwards Air Force Base in the 1950s. It was called Century Circle. So I thought, well, here you have the F-100 to F-106. What would the Century Circle look like if we extend it from the F-110 to the F-117? This is in scale. You ready? There you go. Little different. And finally, if you look at the cockpit and the technology of the airplane, this is the uh, F-105D all-weather version, uh, similar to the F-106 with the vertical tape instruments. You have the gun sighted upper left, sensors, radar, uh, pretty advanced state of the art at that time for mid to late 1950s. 
But here's the F-117 cockpit, the very first integration of digital and analog instrumentation. So can you consider this the same family as the 1950 Century Series? Well, I'll let you decide. But just in closing, this is a Lockheed released photo of the F-35 cockpit. So I have a little story. Pilots who flew the F-105 and the F-106 referred to those airplanes back in the day as the Cadillac of jet fighters. If you look at this photo, I guess the F-35 would have to be considered the Tesla of jet fighters. And there you have it, the story of the Century Series designations. You decide where it all ends, but those airplanes uh, in the 1950s became the link to the uh, multi-role aircraft of the 1960s and 70s, such as this F-16 in a vertical climb over Edwards Air Force Base. As always, special thanks to my dear friends, Tony Landis, Dennis Jenkins, Colonel Chris Ledette, and the use of the Wings and Air Power Historical Photo Archives. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. And until next time, take care.